would like to um, extend a very warm welcome to John Curtis. Now, John is one of those people who does barely need uh, no introduction. I um, mean, he is so well known. He's part of the furniture on election night. He's um, an iconic sophologist. And I, what I really like about him is he looks like an academic, but he doesn't talk like one. He talks like a, a human being, and he talks, he's got the communication skills of a Dimbleby, but um, nevertheless hangs very firmly onto his roots. Now, when um, I was trying to follow him on Twitter recently, I, well, I hadn't realised he's got a fan club on Twitter. Um, it's called Is Sir John Curtis on TV? And so it's got a very large number of followers. I don't know if you knew that. Yes. And <laughs> I did smile. Then Not quite so many followers as I do on my real Twitter accounts, but almost. I did, I did smile when I, said, when I saw you quoted as saying, I've no wish to become a media celebrity. You are. The floor is yours. <laughs> OK. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I, I noticed a couple of days ago that Annan was tweeting that he had three really interesting keynote presentations at his conference. So I naturally drew the conclusion that he must have four keynote speakers. Um, not least because I've talked about this subject of where the public stands on Brexit on a number of occasions in recent weeks, uh, including quite a few occasions in this city. Um, and I've spotted one or two people in the audience, like John Young here, who frankly I think has heard uh, the Heinz variety of this talk before. So if John, you want to go and get a cup of, cup of coffee, that's fine by me. Um, hopefully not all of you have heard all of this, and I've tried to put some new material in, but um, shall we say um, the British public doesn't necessarily create quite the same drama or intrigue that the Brexit negotiations themselves sometimes create. Anyway. So what I'm going to do is to address uh, four questions. Um, first of all, how well or badly does the public think the Brexit process is going, given that's, after all, what we are uh, focusing on uh, this morning? Um, have they changed their minds about leaving? Seems like a fairly important question. Um, if we are willing to accept the assumption that maybe the majority still want to leave, and we'll come back to that, um, what kind of Brexit do voters want now? And you heard some of the difficulties about that process in the previous session. Um, and then, of course, there's also the perennial subject of speculation upon which Tony Blair and Sir John Major have both opined, uh, which is whether or not they want a referendum on the terms of the deal. Um, and I'm going to try in particular to look at the link between some of these questions, and in particular, to what extent is there a link between people's answers to the first question and what they now think about uh, the second one. OK, so um, first of all, um, what do we think will be the economic consequences of leaving? The truth is the British public have never been that optimistic about the economic consequences of leaving. There were always more people who thought we'd be worse off than better off during the EU referendum itself. Um, but what is inter interesting, it's not dramatic. Um, and the first reading actually comes from slightly before the referendum, but this is uh, data from the survey that I'm running periodically as part of the UK and the Changing Europe Initiative. Um, and one of the things we've been asking people is, you know, do you think the economy is going to be becoming better or worse as a result of Brexit? And as you can see, the first reading there is for the autumn of 2016. The last reading is for when we last did it in the autumn of last year. There's some signs of maybe the British public be getting a little more pessimistic about the economic cons of Brexit than they were already. Um, there's more or less a similar message if you take the data that YouGov have been asking and asking on a rather more regular basis. Uh, again, back in the autumn of, last, of 2016, we had 28% of people who thought the economy would be better. It's now slipped a little, and conversely, the proportion who think it will, it will get worse has gone up a bit. It's not dramatic, but this was one of the central issues in the EU referendum campaign. Actually, it was the perception that, above all, was correlated with whether or not people were going to vote, remain, or leave. So perhaps even a small movement is something of which we at least should take due note. More dramatic, however is what you find, as I've been doing, if you ask people whether or not the UK is going to get a good or a bad deal or not. 
back at the beginning of last year, there were almost as many people who thought we would get a good deal as thought we would get a bad deal. But now over a half, at least in the most recent reading, uh, people thought that we were going to get a bad deal. So we've certainly become more pessimistic about what the Brexit negotiations are going to bring so far as the UK is concerned. We've also changed our minds on more than one occasion about how well... Yes, I know, it looks like a rather, rather, rather creepy, crawly uh, insect of some description, rather, doesn't it? But anyway, this, these are our, our ORB's data, and we, they've asked people whether or not you approve or disapprove of how well the government is handling Brexit. Um, there are two crucial events. Crucial event number one is the Lancaster House speech of January 2017, um, after which the public concluded, oh, maybe they've got some idea of what they want to do after all. At least the Prime Minister has given, some, given us some signals. And, moving, and we moved from a re relatively negative set of perceptions on balance to on balance giving the government the balance of the doubt. And then there was that mad walk in the Welsh forest, followed by a rather unfortunate general election result and whatever confidence the uh, UK public had got in what the government was up to as far as Brexit was rather shattered by that sequence of events. And we went back to the status quo ante. Indeed, if anything, now we're slightly more critical. Um, again, very similarly, you, Gav, asking a very similar question. Um, uh, Post-Lancaster, how's things improve? Actually doing the general election on their data, almost as many people think we're handling it as well as badly. And then it goes back to, if anything, uh, slightly worse. So there's not much disagreement about that. But this, of course, then raises the interesting question about, well, who has changed their mind? Is this simply a bunch of remoners going, oh, it really is absolutely awful. We always, you know, we always were really suspicious, and they're now kind of moved very, very firmly into the pessimistic stroke critical camp. Or, actually, is there evidence that Leave voters have also become critical and maybe also more pessimistic, and if so, perhaps with what consequence? Well, um, the truth is that actually when it comes to the economic consequences, the Remain voters were already virtually to a man and a woman utterly convinced that this was going to be an absolute disaster, with about 80% saying that we're, we're, the economy is going to be worse and not much has changed. It's not dramatic because the overall change isn't dramatic, but notice it's amongst Leave voters, amongst whom some at least there's a Sicilian of doubt about the economic consequences, um, and they're you know, much more divided in their views about the economic consequences of Brexit than are uh, those who voted Remain. It's a similar, uh, though not exactly the same picture, when we look at who's changed their minds about uh, who, how good a deal or bad a deal the UK will get. Remain voters have become even more uh, doubtful about the deal we'll get, but notice 17 point increase in the proportion of Leave voters who think we get a bad deal, and actually more Leave voters now think we're going to get a bad deal than think we will get a good deal. And certainly it's not the case that Leave voters are thinking the UK government is doing a brilliant job at handling the Brexit process. Yes, Remain voters have become more critical, but the increase in criticism is by far more marked amongst Leave voters, who again are much more divided in their views about the Brexit process than are those who voted uh, Remain. Um, and again, you get much the same picture from the data that I've collected, the previous data is YouGov, this is the data I've collected. But of course, we should remember that there are two sides to the negotiating table, and that while it may be the case that voters, including Leave voters, have become more critical um, of the UK government's handling the Brexit negotiations, maybe they're none too enamoured of the European Union either. While you won't be surprised to hear, we were none too enamoured, even from the beginning of how the EU was approaching things, but so far, at least, the, Brexit, the UK, EU's approach to Brexit has not helped to endear the institution to UK hearts. Uh, and for my money, this actually, is, uh, until recently, has been one of the aspects of the Brexit process that the commercial polling had largely ignored and I think made a mistake in ignoring. You know, it may, Leave voters may be unhappy about the UK government, but if they're also unhappy about the EU, uh, they may not necessarily, therefore, be changing their minds about the merits of the European Union as an institution. And indeed, I've, I've, uh, now Ipsos Mori have picked up this gauntlet. Their recent poll asked people both how well the UK government and the European Union were handling Brexit. And as I've said, it's two peas in a pod. Basically, we think that both of them are doing a pretty lousy job of the Brexit process. 
So we're pretty critical. Uh, we're more critical than we were, and Leave voters in particular have become rather critical. So we might therefore be thinking, well, surely, therefore, the British public will have changed their minds. Well, maybe. Um, this is the most, the most regular time series where a company has been actually asking the question that appeared on the ballot paper in June 2016. Um, and as you can see, if we take the period up to the general election, there was never an occasion at which BMG had more people saying they would vote Remain than said they would vote Leave. Sometimes they were tied, but either Leave was ahead or it was tied. Since the general election, BMG have never had the Remain side behind. But as you can see, the gap is very, very narrow. Um, and it comes with a health warning that I'm going to go into with rather more at the moment uh, because one that BMG themselves have particularly emphasised. The other company that's occasionally asked the referendum question is Salvation. And again, it's a fairly similar picture. Um, the first readings are immediately after the referendum. They're probably taken too quickly. But thereafter, up to the general election, it's tended to be pretty close since a slight remain lead. But just in case you think that it's kind of obvious therefore where we're going, um, this is the kind of graph you tell your students never, ever to display. <laughs> because as you will have noticed, the, the origin, the, the, zero, the, the bottom of the y-axis is not zero. It's 40, OK? But I've done that because otherwise, you know, you've had to get binoculars out in order to be able to see what's going on. So this is YouGov's in hindsight question, which again is asked very, very regularly. And basically to cut along, and I basic, basically average, smooth the series out for, for a whole series of time points. Once you do that, the picture is very clear. Up to the general election, typically 45% of people said it was right, the decision was right, and 43% said it was wrong. Since the general election, those figures have been reversed. It's a very small, very narrow turnaround, but all of this data is consistent. That said, there are also some polls out there that have not asked the referendum question, but have asked people, how would you vote if there were a referendum tomorrow? Uh, those, until recently, also told a similar story before the election, leave slightly ahead, since remain slightly ahead. But actually, little noticed, the most two recent readings of that kind have had leave ahead. So again, that's again to emphasise the extent to which we shouldn't put too much weight on what has been a very small movement. That said, you may be wondering, well, hang on, Leave voters have become more critical, more doubtful. Why haven't the numbers changed more? Well, let me give you a bit of a clue. Um, here's one of uh, three analyses that I'm going to show you of the same kind. So if you get this one, you'll get the rest. So what I'm showing you here is, the let's just take the first blue column. These are the people who voted Remain in 2016, okay? And they are the people, they're that relatively small group of Remain voters who actually think that the UK government is handling the Brexit negotiations well. And the figure there, the 71% figure, is the proportion of Remain voters of that view who say they would vote Remain again, okay? Um, and then the 95% is the proportion of Leave voters who think the UK government is handling it well, who say they'd vote the same way. So what I'm looking for here is what is the differences as we go from left to right. And what you will notice is that while Remain voters are indeed somewhat sensitive to their perceptions of how well the UK government is handling things, that very small minority of Remain voters who think the UK government is doing a brilliant job are now perhaps inclined to vote Leave, some of them, Notice that Leave voters' propensity to vote the same way again, it's not wholly insensitive to this perception, but it's not very sensitive. The same is true if we ask people their perceptions of how good or bad a deal the UK will get. Those Leave voters who are doubtful about the deal are a little less loyal, but it's not that dramatic a difference. So I think this, um, to my mind, emphasises something that I've been trying to argue for quite some time now, which is the pr common presumption on the Remain side that the arguments about process 
and that the difficulty of getting out as it emerges in the negotiations and the way in which the UK government, in the view of many of Ramona, is messing things up. These arguments do not cut much ice with Leave voters when it comes to the merits of the original decision. Their response to these kind of arguments is, well, look, hang on, if it really is so darn difficult to get out of the European Union, that just goes to prove why we shouldn't be in the institution in the first place, i.e. we are clearly much too interrelated. Where they do begin to take notice is when we come to the issue of the economic, perceived economic consequences of Brexit. Amongst those Leave voters, and there are around a fifth of them, who think that the UK economy will be worse as a result of Brexit, loyalty drops to two-thirds. Which leads me to suggest that if indeed there's going to be changes of attitudes towards Brexit in either the Remain or Leave direction, because you can see Remain voters are also sensitive to the, uh, the perceived economic consequences of Brexit, that movement is much more likely to occur if, we, if, the, uh, if people's views about the original arguments that lay behind the European Union decision, viz that um, the arguments about immigration and about the economy and about the, uh, the underlying principles and merits of leaving the European Union, whether people's minds change on that, and they're not likely to be changed, certainly at least not on the Leave side, by arguments about we told you so and it's all rather difficult. And that perhaps is an important reason to explaining why we don't have that much movement in overall attitudes, um, even though Leave voters have become somewhat pessimistic and critical about the Brexit process. One other reason to be careful, and this is something in particular BMG emphasised, it's not the case that Leave voters are more likely to have switched to Remain than Remain voters to Leave. This is an aggregation of four relatively recent uh, surveys and polls, including my own. And as you can see, it shows that while 8% of Leave voters now say they would vote Remain, conversely, 7% of Remain voters now say they would vote Leave. These two groups are more or less of the same size. There's a little bit amongst Leave voters of, oh my God, you expect me to go away and vote again? You know, I, I've already told you once. The principal reason why there is now a small movement in favour of Remain is because of those who abstained, who are about two and a half to one in favour of Remain. They are, of course, disproportionately younger voters who we know are much keener on remaining inside the EU. But it's bound to be the case, therefore, a question about any second EU referendum. What the outcome would be, well, frankly, it may just simply depend on the turnout. And that, together with the fact that the outcome is so narrow, um, you can see why no political party that isn't committed to remaining inside the European Union, i.e. the Liberal Democrats, but a party that's kind of taking a much more pragmatic position, i.e. Labour, is not jumping into the pool of people who want a second referendum, because frankly, holding a second referendum at the moment would be a highly... Um, well, shall we say, you're taking quite a gamble if you hold such a referendum. Nobody knows what the answer would be, what the outcome would be, not least because it could turn on turnout. But as you can see, certainly what is true, and it helps to explain the views of, of those who abstain, abstainers have become more critical, along with everybody else, about the Brexit process. Um, and indeed, you know, they're now more inclined to think the economy will get worse and we're going to get, get a bad deal. So I guess the other, you know, the other message that comes out of this, we're spending a lot of time focusing on Remain voters and Leave voters and what they think of are they going to change their minds. And in doing that, we may actually be missing the action. The, the, the future of any second EU referendum may lie in the hands of those who did not vote 21 months ago. OK, what kind of Brexit do we want? Um, short answer, and is there any change in this? Short answer, no. In much the same way, there isn't much of a change in attitudes towards the merits of remaining or leaving. There isn't much change in the balance of opinion. These are uh, the data from ORB. It's not the world's most brilliant question, but people are being asked, do you think it's more important, do you agree or disagree that it's more important that the UK be able to control immigration rather than have free trade? As you can see, the, the lines bounce up and down. The blue line are those who agree, so these are the controllers. The green line are the people who emphasise the free market. It bounces up and down, but as an academic colleague uh, once famously coined uh, at a stage when I was working with him, this looks like trendless fluctuation. This is just random noise. Um, Opinium are also been tracking this. They have rather less in the way of random noise, 
And they do have a lot of people who say, oh my God, that really is a complicated question. I really don't know the answer. And they may be the only, the only honest ones. But again, it's very, very difficult. You know, the blue line are those people who say that staying in the single market should be the priority. The green line, those who are saying ending, ending free movement. Very difficult to argue from that there's been any fundamental change. Yes, in exactly the same way as we are divided down the middle over the merits of remain and leave, we are largely divided down the merits of, the mer of, of a hard versus a soft Brexit. And this is not surprising because the truth is the debate about a hard versus a soft Brexit is in many respects a surrogate for the debate about remaining and leaving in the first place. Over around two-thirds of Remain voters will em and have con consistently emphasised the importance of being in the single market, and consistently between uh, uh, three-fifths and two-thirds of Leave voters have emphasised the importance of ending free movement. Now, um, there's perhaps another way of getting at this, and this is the way that I've been getting at this subject via the uh, survey work I've been doing for this initiative. And this is what I call the Noel Edmonds question. So, um, you know, uh, the EU, you know, well, you, some of you heard the tone of some people inside the European Union in the previous session, yeah? So, okay, guys, is it deal or no deal? If you want free trade, it's free movement, that's it, it's up to you. And in those circumstances, should we do, take the deal or not? Um, and again, it's very difficult to demonstrate much in the way of consistent trends uh, in this. So, for example, if we take the most recent uh, data from I have from this, which is in the autumn, 54% of people saying, yeah, we should do the deal in those circumstances, 47% say not. Those figures are very similar to what I had at the beginning of 2017. It kind of fluctuated up and down in between. But again, we seem to be, again, you know, what kind of, you know, when, even when our backs are put up against the wall, still very evenly divided on this subject. But of course, again, this is uh, pretty much a distinction between Remain voters and Leave voters. Remain voters would happily accept the deal, Leave voters would not. Um, so you can therefore certainly see why ending free movement is a red line for the UK government, because the truth is that if you are indeed at the end of the day trying to implement the mandate that was given by the majority of voters, i.e. those who voted to Leave, it's pretty clear that for the majority of this group at least, ending free movement is a more important priority than staying inside the single market. And I think above all the red lines that the UK government has, this is the one up upon which it's going to be most difficult to shift it. There's another red line, of course, that the UK government has, which is about not being as um, uh, subject to the judgments of the European Court. Very, very difficult subject to get at with respect uh, to uh, opinion data. This is the way I had to go at it. It was really kind of crafted in the, in the autumn of last year. So at the one hand, you just say, well, should we follow all EU court judgments? At the other end of the spectrum, you say not. But then in between, it's, well, maybe should you perhaps sometimes do so? For example, with respect to a future trade agreement, which is one area where clearly the, uh, some, in some way or another, the ECJ judgments might be thought to be going to have some influence. And the rights of EU citizens, which is another area where the role of the ECJ has been particularly raised. The interesting thing is, if you ask it in that way, actually, the modal view is that maybe we will have our cake and eat it, i.e., we're willing to accept some ESA judgments. It isn't necessarily perhaps quite the firm red line in the mind of the British public, and I think it's rather interesting that in the Mansion House speech, shall we say, the Prime Minister at least seemed to give some room for manoeuvre on this subject. And I suspect, so far as public opinion is concerned, she may have rather more uh, room for manoeuvre, so long as at least in particular she avoids the issue of being framed in terms of sovereignty. Once you talk, say to people this is Britain's sovereignty being limited, you're in trouble. But if she can simply say this is about an agreement in which we have uh, a joint court, uh, a, a joint form of arbitration, then she can probably have room for manoeuvre. OK, finally, do we want to go through all this again? Most opinion, for most opinion polls, the answer is no. Here's an example from an opinion. Uh, the green line is saying that there should be another referendum. The, green, the blue line is not. But you can notice that probably more recently the level of opposition has somewhat reduced. Certainly when YouGov asked the same question, again, the narrowing of the lines is in evidence, but it's still the case that more people are opposed than are in favour. 
That said, of course, neither of these questions specifies the kind of second referendum that we might have. And the truth is, there are lots of different kinds of second referendum we might have. We might say, let's just rerun the June 2016 referendum, Cambridge Analytica, you know, um, uh, uh, shenanigans means it's all terribly unfair. And we just, you know, we, 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 we go for the same question again. Um, we could have a referendum in which the idea, uh, so that's the second bite at the cherry. At the other end of the spectrum, we could say, well, let's have a referendum on the deal, but the alternative is that we just crash out with no deal. That's the UKIP referendum. Or we could have the Liberal Democrat referendum, which is we have a referendum on the deal, and if we don't like the deal, we'll stay in the EU. Um, or the other possibility is we have a vote on the, re on the deal, but if we don't like the deal, we tell the government to go away and negotiate again which at least from the view of the public is logical, may not be logical from the view of the European Union or the Article 50 process. Certainly these differences matter. The, uh, Lord Ashcroft didn't quite capture all of these differences, but he got quite a few of them. And he certainly showed it really does depend on what kind of re referendum you're asking people to support. So on the left hand for side, for example, is just a game fairly similar to opinion in YouGov. Should we have another referendum? Short answer on balance, no. Right-hand side is the UKIP referendum. Actually, more people are in favour of the UKIP referendum than are opposed. Though you will also notice that at this point, around 30% of people say, you mean to say you're going to ask me to choose between the devil and the deep blue sea? This sounds like a pretty tough choice, i.e. 30% of people say don't know. Um, but Leave voters at this point begin to be less opposed to this referendum because, of course, it doesn't matter what the outcome is, they're still going to get what they want. But what perhaps more interestingly, on the issue of the Liberal Democrat referendum, public opinion seems to be rather more evenly balanced. That said, there are other sources of variation. Um, so although opinion in YouGov tend pretty consistently to say that the people are opposed to a second referendum, ICM, in a very famous poll for The Guardian, which The Guardian kind of splashed on its front page and almost kind of put a hooray after its headline, um, had a majority of people supporting. And but frankly, actually, I could have told the Guardian they could have headlined that drop in support for second referendum because they compared it with the previous observation reading, which is also there. You can see that actually the level of support for second referendum in that uh, ICM poll was slightly less than the previous observation poll. Um, anyway, point is different companies have come up with different answers. Why? Well, because of course they've asked different questions. And in particular, I mean, ask people, should there be another referendum? And they go, oh, my God, we don't want one of those again. Ask people, should the people have the final choice on whether or not we accept the deal or not? Well, of course, the people are not, not going to say to having the final choice. And particularly if you start using language which perhaps suggests that the public are going to be in control of this process, it becomes rather more popular, which, again, uh, partly goes to show that the attitudes towards the second referendum depend on the issue is framed. There is going to be an attempt to try to campaign for one during the course of the summer, and there's some probably pretty good advice to, to them in the, in the divergence of uh, attitudes, uh, answers to these poll questions as to how they should frame the question. It should be about not how we moaners can change the result. That's not the way to frame the second referendum. It's about giving people the choice and above all, giving Leave voters the ability to say yes. That's the way to sell the second referendum. OK, um, and as you can see, Leave voters in particular warm to the idea of a second referendum described in rather more populist terms. OK, to conclude, um, we are evenly divided between soft and hard Brexiteers. We are increasingly critical of handing a Brexit, both Remain and Leave voters. Um, but there is so far only limited evidence of a swing to Remain, and much of it is occasioned by abstention. So we're basically split down the middle about what kind of Brexit we want. We're split down the middle on whether or not we should be leaving in the first place. That said, the, the argument, the kind of basic original argument about the economics of, of Brexit are probably more important so far as public opinion is concerned than these endless arguments about process and handling. Um, there's some 
inconsistent evidence of support of, well, or less opposition to a second referendum, but it does depend on how the issue is framed. Um, and again, that's attitudes towards the, you know, Remain voters are kind of keen on a second referendum, Leave voters are rather opposed to the idea. The crucial thing to understand about this country, and the challenge to politicians on both the Remain and the Leave side, is that 21 months on, we are still very, very divided society. And of course, there are big demographic differences underlying this division. And whatever the outcome of the Brexit process, it still looks as though there's a major challenge out there to our politicians to work out, well, how do we come to some accommodation whereby there is some stable relationship between the UK and the EU in the post-Brexit world? Because at the moment, at least, whatever the government comes up with, it looks as though half the public are likely to be dissatisfied. Well, thank you very much indeed for that, um, John. Can I just pick up on your last point about what a divided society we are? Um, I mean, it's striking that the Prime Minister today is going around the country, reuniting the country with her um, speeches, and she's going to the devolved uh, regions to make these points. Do your polling evidence, you've obviously, presumably it's, it's, it's uh, UK-wide wide data, do you see regional variations? Oh, sure, of course. You know, I mean, London is deeply upset about Brexit, and Scotland is deeply upset about Brexit. Um, and much of provincial England is going hooray. No, sure. I mean, the, the divisions that were in the, were, that were in the referendum are, you know, are, are there. They're continued writ large. You know, equally, younger people, want, younger people still want to stay. Older people want to leave. Graduates want to stay. Those with less than major qualifications leave. And none of these divisions you know, have, have, have ameliorated. You know, that said, however, what you need to understand, particularly about Scotland, is that although Scotland would still vote around 62 to 38 in favour of Remain, the attachment of Remain voters in Scotland to the European Union is much weaker than their attachment to the Union with England. And for most people, it's not sufficient to persuade them to change their minds about the merits of staying inside the UK. And insofar as it has changed people's minds, there's also the around the one in three people who voted yes in the independence referendum but voted to leave the European Union in Scotland who uh, now think that maybe the UK has a bit of sense after all and are less opposed to the idea. So it's not really, so Scotland's not moved, but it still would vote to remain tomorrow. That said, um, what is interesting is that because the, it's clear that the commitment of the remain voters in Scotland to the EU is not that strong, uh, the SNP is beginning to backpedal in its vision of what Scotland's relationship would be with the European Union should it ever become an independent state. And Wales? Um, well, Wales, of course, voted fairly similarly to uh, most of provincial England, and I'm not clear that so far that Wales has particularly changed its mind on the subject. Okay, thank you. And Northern Ireland? Okay. Uh, look, my, my data, most of my data are GB, some of it is UK. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not aware that there's been any dramatic change in attitudes in, in Northern Ireland. Of course, you know, it, the, the, the point about Northern Ireland and Scotland, which distinguishes them from, from England, you know, in England, the debate about the debate about EU, the debate about sovereignty in the European Union is one whereby um, being part of the European Union is framed as a constraint on the UK's ability to exercise its sovereignty. In Scotland, and in, well, for the nationalist community in Scotland and for the nationalist community in the, in, in Northern Ireland, membership of the European Union is framed as a way by which the aspirations of that community can be realised because it's independence in Europe in Scotland, and because uh, the European Union provides some of the uh, underpinnings of the all-Ireland form of governance, which is relatively attractive to the nationalist community. So it's a very, very different debate as a result. Are not, to my, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Right, I'll take, as we did in the last session, um, three or four questions. There was a gentleman there, gentleman there, and a lady there, and then I'll take some questions from this side. Gentleman, a gentleman there in the white shirt. Can you introduce thank yourself? Thank you. Um, hello, is this on? Yes. Sebastian Cody. Sir John, thank you. Uh, it's clear from your figures um, how close things still are. So perhaps you'll forgive a methodology question because accuracy matters when politicians, I mean, we saw repeatedly this morning Tony Blair relying 
uh, to an extent in his arguments on polling data, recent polling data. Um, you made a glancing reference to Cambridge Analytica without getting into whether the Russians did or did not, or whoever, fix the vote. Um, we've known for some years that these people know us better than we know ourselves. I mean, ever since the court case when that dad sued Facebook uh, on behalf of his 17-year-old daughter because Facebook knew before, not only before he knew that she was pregnant, but before she knew that she was pregnant. Um, we, we've known how good that kind of data collection is. They've got five billion data points on these issues. How on earth can you people, who the politicians are primarily relying on, uh, catch up? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then it was, uh, gent was a gentleman there and the lady there has got a hand up. The gentleman behind you. No, just behind you. Hello, I'm Vijay Sarau. Um, to what extent has your work picked up the effect of this ongoing sort of Ramona campaign and Open Britain and these old uh, prime ministers weighing in? How does that skew your data and uh, <laughs> what sort of effect does their continued political activity on this issue have on public opinion? Okay, thank you. And then the lady with the... Uh, thank you. Carol Walker. Um, just picking up on the point about Cambridge Analytica, I know this is something that you haven't specifically polled on, but given your knowledge of um, people's voting intentions, public opinion and so on, how significant do you think those sort of very carefully targeted messages can be in swaying what was, in terms of the referendum, a very tight vote? And do you think that the... Um, the, the reporting of this, the fact that it's now been made public, is likely to in any way dent people's uh, confidence or beliefs about the referendum result. Okay, thank you. If you can answer those easy questions <laughs> uh, briefly, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, um, uh, first of all, interventions by Major and Blair. Um, I think they're, uh, both of whom have now come out in favour of a second referendum. Um, there, I think, has been one poll reading since they spoke, and the poll reading was virtually identical to the reading obtained by the same company beforehand. And more broadly in response to your question, I mean, essentially one of the main points I was trying to make in my presentation is that I think, you know, if you, you know, let's say for the purpose of argument, I'm just here playing devil's advocate, okay? Uh, let's say for the purposes of argument, you are somebody who would like to see the EU referendum result reversed and you would like to see public opinion shifted. Essentially what I'm saying to you is that I think so far the Rimona campaign has missed its target. Okay, don't go on about process. Don't go on about how the negotiations are being handled. Don't go on about how all terribly difficult it is and we told you so. Go back to the basic principles of the arguments about being for or against the European Union. You have to win that argument and insofar as you know, subsequent developments might help to change public opinion from your point of view, then it's probably the argument about the economy upon which you have to focus. The difficulty, however, I think, for the Remain side on this <coughs> is that the truth is that what the economists are telling us is not that the British economy is going to crash tomorrow, but rather that the level of economic growth we are going to enjoy will be rather less than it otherwise would have been. Well, what otherwise would have been, we will never have experienced and therefore we will never know. Okay, so I'm not entirely clear what it is that's going to shift it, but certainly you've got to go back, uh, back to those issues. Um, there's a couple of questions about social media and one about reliability of po uh, polls. Um, uh, I mean, the first thing to say about, you know, the, the, the polling data is, you know, one of the reasons why I am telling you don't get too excited if you are a main supporter about polls that say remain 52 leave 48 is that on average the polls before the referendum said remain 40 to 52 leave 48. Now the only message you can take away from the polls when they are all this close is don't ask a pollster who's going to win because the the crucial message that's emerging is that you don't know but if you're a politician deciding whether or not to back such a project that's what you need to know. You need to know that this would be a highly risky project. More generally on social media, well, I'm not an expert on social media. Let me say that straight away. So you can say, take what I say with a pinch of salt. Two, there's nothing new about politicians 
crafting their messages to different audiences. It used to be done in the days of the offset litho machine when you know, parliamentary candidates could deliver one leaflet to one area of their constituency and another leaflet to another area of their constituency, um, et cetera, et cetera. What, of course, is true, or at least allegedly is true, is that these is that now using social media and having some understanding of the profile of people, you think you can identify people who are marginal and who therefore might be influenced by a certain message, and you can do that at the, at the individual level. Um, all that one can say at this point, well, I, I would say two things. One is, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has done a carefully controlled trial of the effectiveness of this technique. Of course, those who engage in it will tell you it works brilliantly, but they're selling you a product. And until there is clear academic evidence, uh, which would require a very carefully controlled experiment, um, uh, that this actually does finally make a difference, I'd be careful. What I think is true, and there is a broader issue here, is that because we've been relatively slow at thinking about the regulation of the content of social media, things like negative spot advertising, and it's not just to do with the referendum, it's also to do with general elections, are now possible in the UK in the way that they were not hitherto because on conventional media, there were, uh, A, it's only party election broadcast, you couldn't buy airtime, and there was a minimum length of the party election broadcast. So there is, a, I think, a, an issue, not necessarily much about targeting, but about the content of social media. And if we're going to regulate this, we've got to be pretty fast because otherwise uh, the, the, the horse is going to have uh, bolted very, very much out of the stable door. And the question... Carol, Carol Walker's question at the back. Well, I thought that was I thought I'd answer Carol's messages about carefully targeted Is messages. It, I can't roll the two things together. Are you together. happy with the, the answer? Yes, yes. Grand, thank you. Right, we've got um, a couple more minutes left, uh, and I'll take a couple of questions from that side. There's a gentleman um, on the far side, and, and there's a lady at the front. Hey, Tom Schuller, given the propensity of young people to vote Remain, what's the actual and potential magnitude of the impact of new voters if? young voters coming on the rolls if there's a second uh, vote. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, lady at the front, and we might, if you're free, we'll squeeze you in as well, the gentleman at the front. Um, I don't know. My, what's your question? Hello. You said abstainers are very important. Do you want just, the uh, microphone's just coming. Uh, my, my question is very similar. Abstainers, you said they're very important, and yet you showed us very little data about them. Can you point me to where I can find more data about them? Thank you. And then the gentleman, a couple of down. In, if you have anything to add to anecdotal evidence that I'm seeing of people just saying, let's just get on with it. We've, we, let's make the best of, the, of a bad job. Blitz spirit, May 1940, let's just pull together. Are, they, are you seeing any sign of that? Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the last question is if you put that proposition to people, I mean, it, it, it's in a Comrades poll um, out today, although that poll has a rather large uh, recall leave vote. Um, of people, you know, saying that. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly what's true. There's a sense of frustration, right? There's a sense of frustration about, about amongst both Remain and Leave voters about the apparent slowness and difficulty of the process. But I think probably then, you know, uh, they may not necessarily all draw the same uh, draw inclusion. But yes, there's there's a group. I mean, I certainly would accept, and I think it's again another implication of what I've shown you, is that there pro. That, we shouldn't overemphasize the solidity of the Remain vote. And that if indeed the Brexit process ends up not being as bad in its outcome as many Remain voters currently thinks it could be, it may well be the case that Remain voters will kind of accept what's happened. Um, I, I certainly think you know, that is possible, and certainly some of them do say, you know, you know, let's get on with it. Um, um, I, I, on the potential new voters, well, I think I've not had time to read it, but I did see it being headlined. That there's something the 2021. It's going to be presented this afternoon. My, my, my colleagues, who are very brave, are saying that the thing is going to be just simply because younger people well, are more likely still to be with us in 2021 than our older people, that um, we even a referendum by them might have a, have a different result. Maybe, maybe. Um, of course, the other way of arguing it is, indeed, as they are arguing, um, immigration is becoming less of a concern. Well, why is immigration becoming less of a concern? Because immigration is dropping. And why is immigration dropping? Well, perhaps because we're deciding to leave the European Union. So, you know, yeah, we, we can see which way, which way it goes. Certainly what I think is true is that there, that there won't be enough new young voters in the electorate by um, the uh, March of next year. I mean, if we regard the March of next year as the latest point at which we can change our minds, 
then I, th there weren't going to be enough of them in, by that time to change the outcome of the referendum. What we will think in 10 or 20 years' time... I mean, I, I always re it's always worth bearing in mind that the generation of people who voted to stay in the common market in 1975 are the generation of people who voted to leave. So, who knows, all right? I'm not as brave as my academic colleagues. Um, well, uh, if you want to send me an email, I'll send you a bit more about abstainers. I did say about more about it at a conference um, a couple of days ago. But they are, you know, they are disproportionately, you know, younger voters. Now, they almost fall into two groups. There clearly are some of them who basically really are not interested, don't care, really don't understand. And, you are, and, and, you know, there's a body of them who go, you know, basically say don't know to virtually every question about the future. But then... Those who are saying they're going to vote remain do elicit remain type attitudes, and conversely, those on the leave side. But you know, because they are disproportionately younger voters. You know. But again, caution, caution, caution. Right? Remember, despite all the hype, that Labour campaign focused at young voters was not particularly successful at getting young voters to the polls. So you um, basically the age gap in turnout in the EU referendum, as it was the case in the general election, was roughly in line with what the age gap in turnout is usually in British elections. So something fairly dramatic has got to happen if you're going to narrow that age gap in such a way that it might be to the advantage of the main side. On which point I will draw this session to a close. Thank you very much indeed, John, for your magnificent contribution.